says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What a world we have built for our children. Atheists tell them there is no God. Am I not on top? Atheists tell our children there is no God. Activists tell them they can change sex. <coughs> Adverts sell them everything. Apes, they are told, are what you descended from and animals you are. And adults are often too self-absorbed to stand against the onslaught of the evil. And yet, against all of that, Jesus says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For theirs is the kingdom of God. And Jesus has a note of warning for those atheists, for those activists, for those advertisers, and for those antichrists. And in 942 he said, If anyone causes anyone of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea and a large millstone to be put around their neck. I've got a little bit of an echo there, Tom. Sorry. It's quite a warning. Have you ever been nearly drowned? I won't ask if you've been drowned, you wouldn't be here. Have you ever been nearly drowned? When I was a child, I got caught in quicksand once and got pulled out by my mum. But when it actually happened, I was absolutely terrified at that feeling that you're sinking and that the end is near. It is a very, very strong warning that Jesus gives here. He talks about this millstone around the neck. This millstone was actually called the donkey stone. That's literally what it says. Because it's so uh, large and heavy, you have to have a donkey to turn uh, the, um, the millstone round. It's, it's interesting, though, how, how what Jesus says when he's uh, talking about uh, children, it follows on from what he said about marriage and divorce. And marriage and children are linked. Though our society has forgotten that a little bit. But anyway, we have this, um, these two sayings from Jesus. On the one hand, let the little children come unto me. That very positive word. But also that word of warning for those who would hinder the children. And it would be better if a millstone put around your neck and you'd be drowned. Uh, let's look at this uh, scene first of all. With the uh, people... They are flocking round Jesus. They obviously know that there's something special in Jesus. Obviously starting to put their faith in him. And some of them, presumably the parents, they're starting to lead the children to Jesus. And they want Jesus to put his hand on the children to bless them. There's, there's, there's faith there, isn't there, on the part of the parents. They are bringing the children to Jesus that he might touch them. And the disciples then sort of want to prevent this, don't they? Um, probably they thought Jesus was very busy. Uh, probably they thought the children wouldn't understand Jesus anyway. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. Let the kids come to me. Don't stop them. God's kingdom is theirs. He's crossed with the disciples and he welcomes the children to him. And the disciples are told, practically, and in other places this is true, to learn from the children. That actually the children understand a lot better than you might think. They understand. 
They have that pure heart, that heart which is like a sponge, isn't it? It just soaks up what they are told. And this really is the essential thing about being a child, isn't it? When Jesus says that we need to be like the children, otherwise we won't enter the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. If you think what's the key thing he's getting at here for a child, it's, it's that uh, the, the child believes. In John chapter 1 it says, whoever believes to them he gave the right to become... A dad will tell his son, oh, I used to fly planes. The son believes. Mum says, oh, I won a beauty pageant when I was little. The daughter believes. Or whatever it may be. The children believe what the parents, what the teachers tell them. Notice first it's the parents, then it's teachers say. As they grow up, their, their point of reference changes, doesn't it? The people who they believe in people that they follow. But children also have a great capacity to believe in God, to believe in Jesus. And this is what Jesus wants us to be like. So often as adults we can become very critical, can't we, and questioning and cynical. And we need to come back again to simply believe in what Jesus says as the children. Now I want to look at the negative side first and then we'll come to the positive side. So this is going on then and the children are being brought to Jesus and Jesus says let them come. He says do not hinder them. And we ask that question then. What is it? What is it to hinder a child? Earlier on in chapter 9, it talks about causing one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble. Some translation says uh, uh, offending the little children or causing them to sin. The, the Greek word is literally to scandalise. It has several meanings uh, which are explored in the New Testament, but the essential one here is turning somebody away from the person that they trusted. You're making that person then offensive to them. That then becomes, uh, it becomes scandalous to be associated with them. So it's that turning from initially trusting and initially following to hearing something and then thinking, hmm, better see a clear of them. I, I saw a very clear example of this once in a film. And actually, it was a, a film that was just built as a family film. You know, all the family could sit down and watch, kids and all and everything. And it was a film, and in this film, there, there, was, a, there was a child who, um, who went to church and who, who loved to follow the saints and knew all the different saints and everything. And um, it was a Catholic church he went to. But one day, the little child the little boy, eight or nine years old, asked the priests about the bread and fishes. And the priest says, oh no, you've got to understand it. What really happened was that one boy gets his sandwich box out and gives it to the disciples, and then all the other people in the crowd remember their sandwich boxes and get them out. And the little boy is like, oh, thanks for explaining that to me. And all and that is absolutely tragic, isn't it? We can all see the great scandal there in causing a little one to doubt in the miracles that Jesus has done. And that is what is going on throughout our society. That little ones with that capacity to believe God, that capacity to love God, to follow him, that better knowing adults are explaining to them how things really are. Who is Jesus talking about here? 
He is talking about the little ones who believe in me. That's the key thing there. It's turning the little ones away from their faith. And when you understand the horror of that, of causing a little one to no longer believe, then you can understand that awful punishment that the Lord Jesus proclaims, can't you? That millstone around the neck. There is pressure on children all the time these days. An atheist world, activists out there, pressure from society, pressure from peers, I mean, when I was little, 15, 16, your friends would say, oh, have you had a cigarette yet? And there was that peer pressure. Today, there's far, far worse things out there. Let us move now to the positive side. I don't need to explain the negative side to you anymore. You, you know it. It's out there, isn't it? How can we play the part of the adults in this scene who lead the little children to Jesus? How can we play the part of the adults who put the children in a position where Jesus can touch them? Because that's what we want to do, isn't it, as Christians? We want our children, our grandchildren, our nephews and nieces, whoever it may be, we want them to come in contact with Jesus. We want Jesus to be able to put his hand on them, to touch their heart, to touch their spirit. So how do we do that? And as an answer to this, um, I'll go through uh, one or two scriptures, but as a guide scripture, I want us to go to 2 Timothy. Now, now this is interesting because uh, Timothy is called by Paul, my dear son. Now, it might be his physical son, I'm not excluding that, but um, there's also a very strong possibility that this is what Paul calls a son in the faith. In other words, it's somebody who Paul has brought to Christ and he's taught him, and Paul has become, if you like, a father figure to him. And that's an important thing just to consider, because we might not all be fathers and mothers, but they're all people that we are spiritual and, and, and uh, uh, fathers and mothers too, isn't it? We can, all, we can all be that. Whether we are physically parents or not, we can all have people that we take the place of a mentor for them, a father for them, a mother for them. So Paul is writing to, to, to Timothy, so 2 Timothy, um, in chapter 1, Notice there, verse 2, he calls Timothy, my dear son. And the first thing I want to draw your attention to, in verse 3, Paul says this, I thank God whom I serve, as my forefathers did with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. So that's the very first thing that we can all do in order to be like these people who brought the children to Jesus that he might put his hand on them. We can all do that, so to speak, in prayer. We can all follow Paul's example of night and day, constantly praying. He, noted, he mentions in the next verse uh, the, the tears that he recalls in the person as he longs to see them. But this is something that every one of us can do. And I want to give you a few illustrations of, of this idea of praying for uh, the children. The first one is a story of a mother who's got many children. Doesn't say from the story how many she's got, but, but she gets struck with consumption. And she's lying in bed about to die and one by one the children come in to kiss their mum uh, goodbye all the way down to the little baby who's then placed in her arms 
Uh, as she takes the baby, she's very upset, and um, uh, people are worried that all that, that, that extra stress and sorrow might, might, might push her over the edge. And the husband is standing there, and the dying woman says to the husband, it's 19th century language, I charge you, sir, bring all these children home with you. She knows she is on her way to heaven as Christian lady. And she's putting her duty on the Father. Make sure that they all make it to heaven <laughs> as well. Another story is of a rich father who could buy his son anything he ever wanted. He's got fields, he's got mansions. His son is 17 years old. And we pick up the story, the son is at death's door. And that rich father with all his wealth would have given anything to save the son. He would have bought any medicine, he would have hired any doctor, he would have paid any price for surgery. But all of this was to no avail. The son was dying. It was not possible for him to live. And in the son's last conversation with the father, the son says, Pray for my lost soul, father. You have never prayed for me. And all the father could do at that point was weep. We knew the truth of those words. Finish with a, a, a more positive example. Uh, once again, a son is dying. Once again, a father goes to the bedside. And, and the son asks the father, Am I dying? And the father says, Yes, my son. And the son says, Will I be with Jesus tonight? And the father says, Yes, my son. And then the son says, then don't you worry, Father. Don't cry. When I get there, I will run straight to Jesus and I will tell him that all my short life you have been trying to lead me to him. So the first thing that we can all do is to take these challenges and encouragements and to pray for our young ones. To pray for our children, our grandchildren, our nephews and nieces, whoever it may be. They are in an absolutely horrendous, evil world and they need our prayers. Night and day, Paul prayed for Timothy. Uh, flipping over into chapter 2 in Timothy. Chapter 2. Christian man, 
and um, I, I was praying with him after the service once, and, and he was quite distraught, absolutely a bit, because his daughter had just been found out to be pregnant outside of marriage. And here he was, a respected person in the church, in bits, and didn't know what to do. And he said to me, he said, yeah, but how can I correct her when I was such a lad, when I was young? And I said to him, yeah, but since then, you've repented. Since then, you've turned to Christ. Since then, you know what is right and what is wrong. <coughs> you know, so sometimes we can, we can uh, accuse ourselves of a false charge of hip hypocrisy. In Romans chapter 2, it gives pictures of hypocrisy. It says, do you who say, thou shalt not steal, do you steal? In other words, hypocrisy is when you are still doing something and tell somebody else it's wrong. Apo hypocrisy is when you are still committing adultery and telling someone else adultery is wrong. Or when you are still stealing and telling someone stealing is wrong. Hypocrisy is not when you have repented, when you have turned your life around, when you have come to Christ, and then you say to somebody else, that life that you are leading is wrong. And actually, I speak from experience. I know myself that that life was wrong. Whatever our previous life was, we can, after we've repented, after we've come to Christ, we can then lead other people, younger people, children, in the way of truth and in the way of our Lord Jesus Christ. And hopefully, once we become Christians, we can pass that faith then on to our children. One day our children will pass that on to their children. Hopefully that faith will go from generation to generation. Flipping over then into 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 14 <coughs> and 15. It says there, Paul speaking to Timothy, From infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. We can pray for our children. We can give them a, an example of a Christian life for our children and grandchildren. And also we can teach them the scriptures. We can tell them the truth. That they have not come from apes. But they are created in the image of God. We can go back to the Bible and show them that. If we want to teach about morality, we can go to the story of Joseph. And Potiphar's wife was after him. We can show how he resisted her. We can go to the Bible and teach lesson after lesson after lesson, applying modern day situations uh, to stories in the Bible. Let's go to the book of Ruth. If we want to teach young people morality today, a beautiful place to go is the Book of Ruth. Now in the Book of Ruth, the first thing I want to draw out here is that Boaz knew Ruth's character. So this is a story in the book of Ruth of how a couple come together and how they get married. But how it begins in the early chapters. We've got Boaz observing Ruth from a distance. Seeing her character. 
And it's a great thing, a, a great thing in life is to be able to judge the character of other people. And think, is that a person I want to associate with? As teenagers, people learn, shall they be a good friend? Shall I associate with that person as a friend? And later on, as people are searching for a husband or a wife, they can use those same abilities that they've got of how to judge if somebody is a good friend and ask themselves, how can I judge if someone is going to be a good partner for life? So, um, Ruth, the book of Ruth, chapter 2, verse 5. Boaz has noticed this young woman, uh, Ruth, and he asks the foreman in verse 5, whose young woman is that? And the foreman replies, she's the Moabites, who came back from Moab with Naomi. And she said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. And she went into the field and has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz then, at a distance, straight away is able to see what sort of character is this young lady. They can pick up several things there, right? You can see, well, she's loyal, come back with her um, mother-in-law. You can see she's a hard worker. By observing people from a distance, you can find out what sort of person they are. First thing I learned about my wife was she beat me in a Greek exam at college. <laughs> oh, she's the one for me then. <laughs> But as you continue, I flip in, 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 into verse um, 11. Notice, uh, as Boaz says, I've been told about all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and mother in your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. So Boaz has taken notice of Ruth's sacrifice, of Ruth's character. Look into chapter 3. Now chapter 3 is an interesting one. Because in this chapter, Boaz and Ruth are together at night. No one else is around. They are alone on the threshing floor. What happens at that moment? Look at chapter 3, verse 14. She lay at his feet until morning. What an example of purity that is for our young people. Yeah? They had every opportunity, didn't they? The next bit it says, they got up before anyone could be recognised. Yeah? They had secrecy on their side. They were alone, they were private, no witnesses. They remained pure. What a lovely picture. If we go into chapter 4, this is then the, it comes towards the climax of the story, uh, when, when Boaz and Ruth uh, um, are going to come together to be married. Uh, you notice in chapter 4, there's a mention of witnesses. He's gathered together the important people of the town. Today you are witnesses, verse 9, that I have brought Naomi and all the people, all the property of Elimelech, Kilion and Mathon, and I have also acquired Ruth the Moabites. And he finishes his speech at the end. Today you are witnesses. And verse 11, the elders and all those at the gate say, we are witnesses. An essential part of marriage is that public witness that the people see, that the family see, that the village see, because they will all be helpers in assisting that that marriage relationship remains strong. The elders then say, uh, verse 11, continuing, we are witnesses, may the Lord make the woman who is coming to your home by Rachel and Leah. Notice how that starts, may the Lord. It's a prayer, isn't it? the essential part of marriage. You're coming together with the witnesses, you're making a promise to each other, but you're seeking the Lord's blessing. A prayer. May the Lord 
dot, 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 dot. Verse 13. So after they've uh, um, come together in public, after they've been prayed for, then we get, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Yeah. And then he went to her, you can fill in the gaps there, and the Lord enabled her to conceive. But you see the order that has gone there. But what I'm getting at is this, is that we as parents, as grandparents, as uncles and aunts or whatever, we can go to the Bible. And when our young people are asking us, how do I live? We can say, well look at Ruth and Boaz. Boaz observed her from a distance found out about her character. Then they come to get to know each other, and yet they maintain uh, a distance that they didn't transgress, they didn't sin. Then comes the marriage, and after the marriage, uh, there is the consummation, and after that you get children. A wonderful picture there, a wonderful story. So let us finish. In the book of Timothy, there are uh, 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 three verses there are explaining how we can bring our little ones to Jesus that he may touch them. We can pray for them. We can live lives of faith before them, showing them the way. And we can teach them from the scriptures. Let us pray.